Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Train. Good evening. How are you, Sujit? Absolutely well. How are you, sir? So far, very good. <laughs> Looking up. The day is still young. Absolutely, yes. Hey, Harsh. Hi. Good evening, sir. Ki allergy. Harsh. Are you back, Harsh? Punch gaye kya? Yeah, yeah. I'm punch gaye. Punch gaye. Okay. Sir, uh, Mashobra. Oh, oh, what a life, yeah. Arre, what a life. So, I know they can't see Kenya, I see we have one. But then, why? Why are you doing this? I'm going to go to the next one. 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 We are here in full strength. Hey, Harsh. Perfect. So we can we can start then. Great. So, so Abhinish, you're a what knight? He's not, sir. He's in spite of that, he's reached the top of his field. That's that's what I was. Yeah. Thinking. Ah, <laughs> that is true. That's true. They he always say something about. They, they always they about are, us, no? they, they, they are, sir. No, no. Yeah, I'm a dip side, sir. I'm a dip side. They are they are, they are the two exceptions. Harsh and uh, Amrishi are the two exceptions. <laughs> वो मॉडर्न स्कूल है ना वास्ते एस्पिरेशन सी एस्पिरेशन ही रहेगी। हाय हाय। ओके लेट्स स्टार्ट। राइट। गुड इवनिंग। अनिल वी आर गोइंग लाइव नाउ। पेजन या? या लाइव सर। प्लीज। थैंक यू। गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन। ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ मेरा डॉक हार्ट केयर फाउंडेशन लंडन स्कूल ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स � uh, Modern School Old Students Association and IP Global. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, and especially the panelists to this very important discussion around COVID and comorbidities. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, uh, I'll quickly talk a bit about uh, Mera Doc, which is uh, a startup which has been launched during COVID itself. It's still to be launched, uh, which is going to be focusing on personalized telemedicine solutions uh, to connect highly experienced GPs and related services to the patients because that has emerged as a need. Uh, we are also very happy that the, the Heart Care Foundation, Dr. K.K. Agarwal's foundation, who did a lot of work for, for COVID in terms of, uh, you know, uh, creating the awareness around COVID, uh, his foundation has also joined hands with us in this. And uh, his legal, legacy is being taken forward by his children, Nena and Nilesh. Uh, this is also being streamed live on all their uh, channels and they have about 100,000 uh, uh, followers. So it's going to be streamed live on their channels as well. Uh, our other partners are the London School of Economics, Delhi uh, Alumni Association and LSE has also been doing a lot of work around COVID and COVID camps, uh, the Delhi tab chapter especially. So they're also here. And IP Global, of course, of which I'm a managing director. IP Global is also working a lot on the COVID related uh, work. Uh, we work in the development sector, especially in the health sector, and we are managing the, the entire technical support for private sector funding, the emergency relief that the US aid is, is providing as part of WAVE 2. It's through a program called Samrit, where they're actually giving grants and blended finance facility to any private sector player who's looking at expanding or trying to, uh, to meet the challenges uh, that might be faced going forward in creating health infrastructure and communication in COVID. Uh, in fact, if I was really asked to, or any of us were asked to look up a dream 11, because now is the time of freaking a dream 11 of, of top doctors who could talk about COVID and comorbidities, I think the three doctors that we've managed to, to, to who've consented to be part of this today uh, would, would feature in any dream 11 that anybody across India would, would really, uh, you know, uh, put together. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to all three of them for uh, having consented to be with us. Uh, although they need no introduction, uh, I will still so quickly uh, talk a bit about them. Uh, Dr. Naresh Trehan, of course, everybody, I'd, I'd be surprised if anybody uh, who's got anything 
distinctly also or, or, or to do with the health sector would not know of, but Dr. Naresh Trehan is the chairman and managing director and chief cardiac surgeon of the Medanta. He pioneered heart surgery in India and uh, has earlier set up the Scott's uh, Heart Institute. Uh, that was the time when, when people from India used to go overseas to get uh, any kind of heart surgery. And now we've actually got a reverse flow in India where people from Africa and a lot of other countries, including developed countries, actually come, come to uh, India to, to get heart <coughs> surgery done. He served as the personal surgeon to the president of India since 1991 and has uh, received numerous awards, including the Padma Shri, the Padma Bhushan, the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Award, and the Dr. B.C. Uh, Roy Award. Um, he is, of course, a distinguished modernite and also, uh, you know, uh, on the wall of fame of modern school as well. And uh, I'd like to mention here, uh, Dr. Trehan, that before this Dr. Trehan became so well known, there was another Dr. Trehan who was equally well known in the ENT space. And I, I remember having gone to him right from childhood uh, to his clinic in, in, in uh, uh, right near Plaza in Connaught Place. And he's probably till date the only doctor I've actually looked forward to or enjoyed going to. He was full of life. Uh, one of the most humorous persons that I, I remember. I have very fond memories of him. And I still remember him having uh, telling us about his son who was in New York, uh, you know, doing a, a cardiac surgery. And, and little did we know that that son would come around and turn the entire uh, sector, the private sector, uh, uh, and, and, and make India one of the pioneers in, in uh, uh, the space of cardiac surgery. We've also got Dr. Arvinder Singh Soi, uh, who is the, the chief uh, liver transplant surgeon and chairman of the Institute of Liver Transplantation and Regenerative Medicine at Medanta. Uh, Avi is, of course, uh, a Padma Shri awardee as well, and he's been pioneering the, the liver transplantation in India. Uh, in fact, he has the distinction of having done more than 3,500 living donor uh, liver transplants in India, and uh, this is the highest in the country and the second highest in the world. So we are very pleased that uh, Avi, who's, of course, again, a uh, 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 a friend right from school days. Uh, uh, be thankful to Avid for being here uh, as well in this important discussion. Uh, we are also extremely happy to have uh, Dr. Amrish Mittal, who is uh, an Indian uh, endocrinologist and chairman and head of endocrinology and diabetes at Max Healthcare. He again has been honored by the government of India as, uh, with the Padma Bhushan in 2015. And he's the first Indian chosen for the Laureate Award for International Excellence in Endocrinology. So we've really got, you know, I'm the only one who doesn't have a Padma Award out of the panel. So you can imagine the, the, how distinguished the, the, the panel is. We've got two Padma Bhushan and Padma Shri. I'm sure that's going to be a Padma Bhushan soon as well. Uh, so we're very, very pleased to have them. Uh, coming to our specific topic, we've already got a lot of questions which have come through us during registration. But we, we would also request all of you to please, uh, uh, you know, keep typing on your questions on Zoom and we will then uh, uh, address these. I'm going to be requesting uh, each of them to speak for five to seven, eight minutes on their field. But let me, you know, wave two has taught us a couple of things which we did not know. First of all, it told, it suddenly taught us that the fatality really is much higher than we had seen in, in wave one. Uh, it also taught us the expose the poor infrastructure that we have in the country. It again told us that all ages are vulnerable and it's not that it only happens to the, the, the old or, or, or just the people with comorbidities. Uh, it also told us that while vaccination is a must, but it may not be enough and we need to continue being very careful. And of course, uh, it, it taught us that the variant can continue to change so we cannot assume it's, it's over. And we know that it's still not over. Of course, the next wave has a lot of challenges which are there. We are already planning for it. And I would, I would particularly like to focus on not only the government, but the private sector as well. And, and the development financial institutions are working uh, on that. Vaccination uh, is important, but there are a lot of risks related to that. A lot of questions that we've been asked are, are related to risk. And of course, how would the new virus or mutant really take shape uh, in, in times to come? Uh, one of the biggest concerns that people have is it's a known fact that people with comorbidities have a much higher possibility of, of getting into trouble. A lot of people in this particular wave have not got okay even months after uh, they, 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 they've really uh, gone through this uh, uh, 
virus. They're still having issues around sugar, issues around diabetes, issues around heart ailment. Uh, so there are a lot of questions here. So what I would now, uh, straight away without taking more time, uh, I would uh, request Dr. Naresh Trehan to really give his opening remarks. And I would also, since he's also a, a leading private sector player having uh, promoted uh, Medanta, I would want him to divide his, his, his uh, opening remarks into two parts. One is, what is the role that the private sector as a community is, is capable and should be playing and is geared up to play in what could be the next wave? Uh, what are the challenges they are facing? That's the first part. And of course, coming back to the second and the direct part to his, his field of specialization, there are a lot of questions around, uh, is it uh, riskier for heart patients to have COVID? A lot of people are fearing they'll have strokes. They are having issues around that post uh, post recovery issues as well. So over to you, Dr. Trehan, to please uh, you know give your opening remarks. So good evening, all of you. Thank you, Ashwati. Uh, you stole the whole string of truths when you stated all the facts that we are facing today. If you come circle around, basically, to say what is, has happened in first wave, second wave, and what do we expect in the future? The most significant part that happened between the first and the second wave, which should not have reached this peak that it did, and with the speed and ferocity that it did, is because of the fact we actually invited the second wave. We helped it along to go uh, go to the to the height that it went, and if we repeat that behavior again, then God help us. So we did not leave any stone unturned, including all the religious events and the social events and the political events that they all coalesced into a massive mistake. So one, like you've said already, that people suffered as they went along in between, people have not gotten better even. And if there were any misconceptions about the severity of the disease and what it does to your body, and for the length of time it does to your body, the second wave has actually given us a shocker to say there are people who for five, six months have still not recovered. So now the question is, well, how do we take it into our own mind or brain or DNA to say, what have we learned and what are we going to do to prepare or to deal with the third wave? So these different aspects are very clear what is of course personal behavior that personal behavior definitely will be the key in addition to that will be the way vaccine is rolled out if you look at the modulations it is clear that if we can start by the first of july start vaccinating upwards of 50 lakh people a day we can blunt the third wave by 20-25%. If we can reach the target of by mid-July to 70 plus, 70 lakhs per day plus, we can flatten the wave less than 50%. And if we can by some chance by the end of July reach one lakh a day, we may actually flatten the wave. So that's the contribution of vaccine in two ways. One of course, we are saying that it gives you the protection. The second, as you know, that there are upwards of 30,000 variants roaming around today. And the variants, the way the virologists explain it is that the variants mutate as they multiply inside the body. So the theory behind it is that if you limit the number of bodies that get infected and vaccine seems to be effective in actually preventing uh, infections up to upwards of 80%, then that 10-15% who get infected and get infected in a mild manner, they do not give the, the virus enough opportunity to multiply rapidly and the fact that every time it multiplies, there is a possibility of a, of a mutation that that process can be stymied over a period of time. That's the theory, the virology theory right now is to say if we are going to vaccinate enough people, we may be able to overcome the third wave and have a smoother road ahead as we go forward. So that's the lay of the land as far as number of people get 
get natural infection, develop enough uh, resistance or antibodies, or the ones that are vaccine mediated and develop the immunity. That if we put them together and enough bodies are vaccinated or immune, then we may be able to get a better outcome in the times to come. So we are estimating six months, you're not going to be able to change your social behavior. Those three things that we talk about have to be have to be continued with even more intensity today than we did between the first and second week. The second fact that has emerged very clearly is the mortality in younger people below the age of 50 is double that of the first wave. So that means the severity of the disease that affected the younger age group is, is much higher than all what was before. Coming down to my own field. So if you look at it, the whole mystery was unraveled by the 50 autopsies done by the doctors in Bergamo, Italy, who actually demonstrated that it was a three-phase phenomenon. The fact that the viral multiplies and does damage to the body is only one part of the problem. The cytokine, cytokine response or immune response of the body is the second problem and the degree with which it, it actually appears in the body is responsible for most of the damage. Because yes, virus we knew always will affect the lungs, but they found the virus in the kidneys, in the liver, in the heart, brain, everywhere. So that whole myth was gone that it only affects the lungs. So coming down to the heart, they also noticed that three types of things happened. One, of course, the fact that inflammation caused the capillaries to thrombose and create massive heart attacks. Second, that the muscle itself was inflamed, that you could see, and, and we even till today on MRIs and echoes, we can demonstrate how the inflammation in the myocardial fibrils has happened and how it is just sustained over a long period of time. The third thing was that it definitely does affect the electro electrical system of the heart. The entire uh, system gets affected in many, many people. So the outcome of that is that many people with the mildest of infections will have tachycardia or bradycardia or irregular heartbeats for many months. So we are seeing it three, four, four months, we are still seeing people coming with tachycardia. So that, and if you look at their cardiograms, you can actually demonstrate the changes. The second thing is that their myocardial function comes down. So it's the normal, suddenly it can drop to 20, 25% and people die. We have seen many young people go away because of that. And the third is the fact that in the electrical system, the arrhythmias that it can cause has killed many people because of that too. So basically, it's a pan inflammation of the body. We have designed a complete program road to recovery for long COVID. So we will do the appropriate tests as we go along, including intensive cardiac, pulmonary tests, and any other abnormality that they may have been produced. And also be very careful that you should look for secondary infections, which are very important because we, we say the people have got negative with COVID, their chest X-ray, their CTs are looking better, but then you will see them coming with pneumonias because of the fact that we let them loose. So we have to warn the patients that any change in symptoms when they go home requires immediate attention because you should not let any of the secondary problems that may occur actually carry on and threaten your life. So basically, that's the lay of the land that I know. And I, I know we have most knowledgeable people on the, on the screen here, and uh, they will add much more than I can add right now. But any specific questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. That was very enlightening. Uh, just a quick follow-up before we open it. Uh, of course, we'll have the general questions at the, at the end. Uh, people already typing in. One is, uh, you know, how prepared would you say the government and the private sector is for wave three? Because I think by now we are more or less everybody's con uh, you know quite uh, you know sure that there would probably be a wave three. So how prepared are we? What are the challenges there? 
and then again specific to your your field uh, you know uh, a lot of people fear that they could be clotting they could be you know fluctuations of blood pressure there are questions i've got from people who say that we used to have high blood pressure before covid now after covid we've got low blood pressure chances of a stroke uh, how severe are are those for a for a heart patient and especially also the fact that they can't exercise so you know so so i said basically it starts with the inflammation that we talked about if you are an already existing cardiac patient the chances of precipitating a heart attack because of increased coagulability of your blood can of course precipitate heart attacks and we have seen many many of those and then they the ones who come in time you take them to the to the cath lab you will see over pre existing disease that there are acute clots formed You, you can actually save those people and save their heart attacks if they got get on time. The second thing is that if you if you were to say how do I important part I'm I'm telling you what our observation is that people who are used to exercising they so if they have gone back into their exercising pattern too soon and it's a re relative term too soon they have suffered hugely. you every once in a while you'll hear but we hear all the time that 45 year old 50 year old boy people who just went uh, was just recently we lost a friend he was bicycling i mean he had covid few months ago but then again the diagnosis was arrhythmia so the point is that you can get if you have stents you have to be careful if you have had previous myocardial uh, heart attacks you have to be extremely careful if you are you'll see reverse very often that if you don't have any high, high blood pressure that you develop high, high blood pressure and it will last you several months and then of course uh, uh, you know the mucomycosis is always hanging over the head and it, that that is another big problem so there are many many side effects and and uh, like i said how prepared we are to answer your question look we want we were we thought in the after the first wave we were very ready we had all the knowledge we thought we had all the stuff but every day new things happen and the ferocity and the velocity with which this second wave came nobody expected so we were caught off guard especially it was then first it was beds then it was oxygen then then it was intensive care units because a lot of them got so sick that they went to icus and then we have uh, on top of that now we have mucomycosis the only game changer that is so far looking very good is the fact that if you somebody god forbid gets the infection today you test rtc rt pcr positive the monoclonal antibody cocktail which consists of two antibodies is has been found to be very effective in reducing extremely uh, effectively the the viral viral load consequently most of the people will not go have to go in the to the hospital and most of the, and it's just we had, we had last night another study came out which also showed that it reduces the death in these people who are the vulnerable people by 70% so that may be the new weapon that we have in addition to what we are looking forward to vaccine as a more permanent solution but antibodies so far all the studies done including our own at medanta we are we are back, we are in affinity or administering the antibodies to anybody who has within the first 7 days of getting the symptom or as soon as after the rt pcr comes positive you can have this as in the back of your mind that if it is given it may save that person a huge amount of misery by hopefully 90% will never need to go to the hospital and the 10% who go 70% of them will get better and survive thank you so much i think that was really enlightening uh, let's move over to to the the liver and kidney expert i think right after the heart uh, dr arvind soy i think uh, avi i would really want you to talk about because a lot of people are concerned about the impact on the liver and and the kidney uh, how does covid affect the liver and the kidney what are the symptoms what are the gastrointestinal and liver manifestations of covid 19 <coughs> Uh, what do patients with pre-existing, uh, you know, uh, disease? How do they handle that? Should they be going in for liver transplants during COVID? How safe is it to go to the hospital? So there are a number of, uh, mm. you know, issues around that, and I'm, I, I'd like you to, you know, give your opening remarks as well, please. Thanks, Rajiv. It's a pleasure to be here on this forum today. 
Um, so among, you know, amidst all the gloom, let me first say the positives, if there are any. And I think there are, because we've, we've uh, had a lot of learning. And I know we've lost some precious lives, and that's very sad. But the good things are that we know how to treat this virus much, much better than we did in the past year. So for the third wave, if that were to happen, and it's likely to happen, I think we're going to be able to flatten it compared to the second wave because of many reasons, some of which have already been clearly spelled out by Dr. Tran. And some among those are that we are better prepared for handling children with COVID. We had a lot of cases of uh, young people getting COVID this time, and we're probably going to have many more in the third wave, but now we are geared up. There are pediatric uh, beds being made available. There are pediatric protocols of treatment, uh, which are being circulated countrywide, so, you know, and, and ICU facilities being ramped up. So we will be better equipped. The second thing is that we'll be better equipped in terms of essentials, specifically medicines and oxygen. Those systems have been sorted out. So if there were to be a third wave, I'm sure we'll be able to deal with, uh, you know, the sick patients much better on these counts. We have more beds, ICU, as well as non-ICU COVID facilities, and some of them were temporarily created, and these are going to be kept, uh, you know, in anticipation of the worst, but hopefully we won't have that. So we'll be better prepared from that uh, point of view as well. And then, of course, everything about the variants and the mutants is not bad. Two doses of vaccine still work to prevent severe disease and death in more than 90% of the cases. So that is something we must take uh, notice of. It's, and, and of course, Dr. Trayan has already spelled out that we have this monoclonal cocktail uh, by the Regeneron, Cipla, as well as Eli Lilly, and these will prevent hospitalization and severe disease in 70 to 80% patients if taken in the first week. So, you know, these are the positives. If you can take any, these are the learnings from the first and the second wave, and these we take into uh, our hands as we move forward. And hopefully, the, the of course, the biggest uh, silver lining is that the government has their hands on a much, much healthier vaccine stock now. So, uh, you know, the Serum Institute and the Bharat Biotech are going to ramp up their manufacturing capacity to a total of nearly 18 to 20 crores a month by the by August. So, you know, Dr. Trehan spelled out some numbers of how many vaccines we should do every day, 70 and then 90 lakhs a day. So that's going to be a reality with these numbers of vaccines available. Novavax, which India has actually envisioned to have a billion doses of, is showing excellent results in trials. There is more than 90% protection, even against the new variants. So that's a positive. And that's going to be manufactured by the Serum Institute as well in India. And we're going to have millions of those doses. So I think everything put together, we will see uh, you know, us coming out of this pandemic and getting you know, over this over the next few months, hopefully. So with those positive remarks, I'll then now switch on to the GI and liver and, and kidney disease uh, that you want me to talk about. So now, I think the first thing is that patients who have any evidence of liver disease have to be extra careful in preventing COVID from happening to them. And prevention is general, obviously the usual etiquette for COVID appropriate behavior, which everyone knows, uh, but still half the people don't practice and that's avoiding crowds, uh, physical distancing, proper masking and hand hygiene. And then in terms of diet, Strict no to alcohol. People who already have liver disease should not be taking alcohol. Uh, they should control their weight. They should control diabetes and lipids if, uh, if they are abnormal. Um, and they should be going for regular checks to their doctors. And then uh, the, what, what is a liver-friendly diet is, is a question I get every day in scores on my WhatsApp. And I think that they should take more nuts and fruits and vegetables and garlic and, and fish and sunflower and olive oil and, and whole grain wheat and some tea and coffee in moderation. A no-no is all kind of sugary and salty diet. And of course, I already said no to alcohol and white bread. Even rice is not that great. So 
So these are the are the food tips. And then if somebody already has liver disease, uh, we, is, as a part of three global registries, have actually seen that about 15 to 20 percent of them will progress to more severe forms of liver disease if COVID strikes them. If they already have moderate to severe liver disease, unfortunately, there is 10 to 15 percent mortality. Now, as you know, the mortality of COVID in general population is between one and three percent. So if somebody already has moderate to severe liver disease, then they have 10 to 15 percent chance of dying. And we have in our more than 400 patients, we actually written a paper on this and published it, have found a similar mortality. I think it was 14%. Uh, we are part of, like I said, three global registries which have the same results. So what I have been advising patients of moderate and severe liver disease is that they should actually go in for a transplant because again, in our data, as well as the global registry data, I'm a stickler for data, so I'm not just giving you my opinions. I'm actually telling you about data that is published. So there is a mortality of about 5 to 8% among liver transplant patients, which is, as you can imagine, half of what it is in moderate and severe liver disease. So it's much better to actually have a transplant if one is suffering from moderate or severe liver disease and one is a suitable candidate for transplant and if one can you know, have access to it. Uh, rather than just sit at home waiting for COVID to get over and, you know, landing up into trouble because of COVID and severe liver disease as a comorbidity. Um, vaccination. Now, even though I have personally written emails to all my patients who have liver disease or have had transplants, that they should go in for any of the two vaccines available in India, I still keep getting personal messages Doc, I'm thinking, I'm traveling, should I have the vaccine? I'm thinking, I'm taking this medicine, I'm taking aspirin, should I stop this? Should I have the vaccine? The simple answer is, oh, you know, the vaccine is most important for people with comorbidity and chronic liver disease and chronic kidney disease, especially if you're on dialysis, are the very reasons that you are at high risk from COVID and you must have vaccination and full two doses of it and of course, co-vaccine is spaced by a month and people who have COVID shield can take it, you know, 12 to 16 weeks apart at this point in time. But if you are actually going to schedule some surgeries or traveling abroad, then the government has allowed you to have it earlier. So yes, please go in for that vaccine because it's going to be your biggest protection against landing up with severe COVID. So with those remarks, I'll now touch upon what happens to patients when they have no liver disease and they get a COVID, and then they will get an abnormality of their liver test, their alkaline phosphatase or SGPT or SGOT goes up, and then they come to us in a, you know, in a, in a panic situation. Well, the liver also has the same sort of cells, that's the ACE2 receptors, that the lung has. So the COVID virus attaches itself in the liver like Dr. Trahan said, it's a systemic disease. There are lots of organs in the body where the virus can actually lodge. It lodges in the liver as well. But luckily, liver has a lot of reserve. So although there may be some inflammation in the liver and people may get modest elevation of uh, SGOT, SGPT, alkaline phosphatase, sometimes even bilirubin, usually in more than 97% of the cases, this is pretty harmless unless there is a pre-existing liver disease, they're not actually going to be materially affected uh, in terms of having a liver problem because they had COVID. COVID-related liver failure in a previously healthy individual is almost unknown. So you will have elevation of liver tests for maybe two, three, four weeks, and then they will slowly settle down. If you see a liver expert, they're going to give you some liver supplements and nutrients, but there is nothing to worry if the liver enzymes are up because of COVID, that's the least of the last of your problems, right? Now, uh, a word about kidney disease. Now, chronic kidney disease is another reason why uh, you could be more susceptible to severe COVID. And if, God forbid, one gets COVID, then one can have a higher mortality from it uh, with or without dialysis. So again, please do not hesitate when you 
you know, when you're thinking of vaccinating, if you have kidney disease. And all the people with comorbidities need to up the frequency with which they are following up with their doctors, whether it's heart disease or kidney disease or diabetes or liver disease. Because obviously, you need to control it. You see, if you have, and Amrish will bear me out, if you have diabetes, which is well controlled, that's much less of a risk than a poorly controlled uh, sugar. So similarly, if the liver disease is well controlled, that's a less, lesser, lesser risk. And if the liver disease is out of control, you know, uh, hepatitis B or C or a cancer or any other form of liver disease, whether it's fatty liver disease or alcoholic liver disease, then, then you're in more serious trouble. And that's why you should keep seeing your, um, you know, liver and kidney and heart experts regularly. So those are the few comments I'd like, you know, to people to, you know, take home as a message. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Soi. That was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, very useful. And I'm sure a lot of questions have been answered. But while while uh, uh, you and Dr. Train have been speaking, quite a few questions are being typed in the Q&A. &A. We'll, of course, go back to those. I will read out some questions. It might be useful if you might want to simultaneously scroll through those so you can straight away know which are the ones relating to your field. Uh, coming now to, to, to uh, uh, Dr. Amrish Mithil, I think perhaps the in, if, it, if it is any indication on what is an area of maximum concern as far as comorbidity is concerned based on the number of questions we got before the, before the, the uh, webinar, uh, it's probably around diabetes, around sugar, around black fungus, a lot of people have been complaining about sugar going up post, uh, post uh, uh, COVID. Uh, a lot of people have been, of course, complaining about, you know, you have to take steroids uh, as one of the, the, the most important treatments for COVID. That in turn leads to, to fungal infection, black fungus. That in turn could lead to, uh, you know, antifungal treatment could really lead to kidney failure as well. So a lot of uh, these comorbidities are linked. So what should a patient do uh, when he's got these symptoms, we've got we've got questions where people are saying that you know even months after after uh, recovering from COVID, they still have fluctuations in their sugar level. They never had uh, diabetes before. What should a, a pre-diabetic patient do? What should a diabetic patient do? When should they? Uh, when and how often should they get tests done? And and uh, you know uh, what are the other related issues? Over to you, Doctor Bitsu, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwini. So it's a pleasure to be here and. Uh, you know, to give a background, uh, you know, we have to look at it in, in like two sort of separate areas. And that is they're interlinked, but at the same time, they're separate. What is the impact of COVID on people with diabetes? And what is the impact of diabetes on COVID progression and outcomes? Right? So it's a loop. What does COVID do? So supposing I am, let's talk of the latter first. Supposing, uh, you know, uh, someone has diabetes pre-existing diabetes, uh, their chances of contracting the COVID infection, corona infection, is not significantly, are not significantly higher. It hasn't been shown that. So that's number one. People think I've got diabetes, I'm going to get hit by COVID for sure. Not true, right? But if they do get COVID, then their chances of poorer outcomes are higher as compared to someone who does not have diabetes. That we all understand. At the outset, we need to know what does this mean? This means that if you have diabetes, then your chances of getting hospitalized are higher. If you are hospitalized, then your chances of getting you know, into the ICU are higher and subsequently whatever. So there is a risk of adverse outcomes. And in our own data, which we published in December of 401 uh, consecutive patients who were hospitalized last year uh, in August, September, we found that diabetes was a significant predictor of adverse outcomes. Right. So, and even the admission HPA1C, which is a three month average of your preceding uh, three months of blood glucose average of the preceding three months, that correlated with outcomes. So, it did seem that diabetes had an impact on outcomes. But again, as Avi very rightly pointed out, you don't put all diabetes in one basket. So, there are people who have relatively recent onset diabetes, or even if it's uh, even if it's long duration diabetes, there are people who have well controlled diabetes without other comorbidities. And such people actually are almost as good as a, as a someone who doesn't have diabetes. 
So the ones at risk that we found even in our study were the ones who had multiple comorbidities. Okay, so, so for example, if diabetes is poorly controlled, of course, age is an important factor in determining outcomes, but if poorly controlled diabetes exists, diabetes with vascular complications exists, like, of course, as already discussed, kidney, liver, heart, it has a huge impact on outcomes. Uncontrolled with comorbidities, even diabetes and hypertension together make a much more potent mix for poor outcomes than just diabetes. So it's not just the blood glucose that's doing it. If you, are control, if you control your blood glucose well and keep your other parameters in control, like blood pressure, et cetera, simply by connecting with your physicians regularly, which is now possible in most cases by telemedicine and the use of remote consulting. In this, in our field in endocrinology and diabetes, it, it actually lends itself very well to remote consulting also. So if you can keep your parameters within a range, then your risks can be substantially reduced even if you get hit by COVID. So this is the connection that we have. What happens if a person with diabetes gets COVID? What happens with if, if the other thing that happens is that, that, that the sugars worsen. There is no question about that. What COVID does to diabetes? It worsens the sugars and A, any infection worsens the sugars. B, any serious infection, a severe infection, definitely has a greater impact on sugars and stress, hyperglycemia, not just in infection, but in Dr. Trehan's patients in the wards we have seen, in Avi's patients who are otherwise healthy, when they are very stressed in their medical, physically stressed in the, by their medical condition, their sugars tend to go up, right? So, so you have that. So one is just any infection, then the, the stress of any disease, acute disease. And thirdly, it is possible that the virus itself may be playing mischief there. Like other parts of the body, there have been studies now showing that the pancreas may be directly hit. Very last week, a study again came out showing an autopsy study showing that the pancreas of people was impacted by the virus. You know, pancreas is involved in insulin secretion. And the last point on that is that steroids are the most commonly used agent, which are actually, if used correctly, are life-saving for our patients in COVID, during COVID. And steroids have a huge impact on diabetes, on blood glucose. So people, even people who have not had diabetes, who are either in the pre-diabetic zone or not even in that zone, sometimes can get high blood glucose when they are given these high doses of steroids, especially when they are hospitalized. And one of the big challenges this, this year was that many of these patients could not get hospital beds. So through remote consulting, Patients on high doses of steroids, home oxygen, we were managing people with blood sugars of 300, 400, teaching them insulin, how to monitor, but it worked. Let me tell you that if, if you get proper advice and if you follow it, even with severe hyperglycemia, we call it, very high blood sugars related to COVID and steroid, it is possible to get a good outcome. So, of course, we all know that this virus sometimes behaves in a very uh, sort of uh, funny, is not the correct word, in a very strange way. And sometimes it, it belies all predictors, you know, and it just does its own thing. But by and large, you can reduce your risk very substantially if you follow that. So, remember one important point before I, I, I hand the uh, mic back to you is that the prevalence of diabetes in India is very high. And we are actually looking at what we call a syndemic. A syndemic is when two epidemics converge, like when two things converge. So we already have an underlying sort of epidemic of diabetes. You know that in Delhi NCR, where we are talking right now, the prevalence of diabetes at the age of 40 would be above 20%, 20, 25%. And the age of 60, it would be like 35, 40% of people are already diabetic. So imagine in this fertile field, for the COVID to grow, you, you sprinkle this, throw this COVID virus all around. On the other hand, if there was a population which had a diabetes prevalence of 2%, like India had maybe 50 years ago, okay, then the impact of COVID via the diabetes mechanism would be much, much less. So this is actually a wake-up call for us that unless we deliver chronic care better, 
we'll whenever in subsequent god forbid any uh, epidemics or pandemics we'll be hit much harder so therefore it's important for us to do both things together not to panic if we have diabetes but controlling it well even with i mean even without covid and and making sure that we reduce our risk if you are overall healthier our risk will be much less uh, from from uh, getting impacted by covid perfect thank you so much uh, uh, dr mithal i think uh, uh, that's clarified a lot of uh, questions i'm just going through the questions as well but i think the opening remarks of all three of you have addressed a number of uh, questions and now that we've we, we've got another 15 odd minutes left let's just uh, a lot of questions have been uh, already typed in if you'd like to pick up any but i would just maybe uh, pick up a few i'll read out the questions and then uh, you know uh, you depending on who would like to answer that uh, there's a question around uh, you know the black fungus cases uh, in kids in in mumbai uh, somebody's uh, uh, riya sethi said that her, her son is 9 years old and recovered from covid she wanted to ask if he's still open to infection as the reason fungus is not provided uh, how uh, how much of risk is he still at uh, there is uh, then we've got another question that uh, uh, people say that corona is uh, covid is airborne uh, i've not been going out i've been advised not to go out to parks as well if i don't exercise then how do i uh, you know keep fit if i don't keep fit it's a catch 22 situation i can still have my diabetes uh, uh, gets affected my my heart situation doesn't uh, improve uh, there are some questions around people who had the first jab of uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, covi shield or go vaccine and now they wanting to know whether they can have the second jab of pfizer if it's available uh, and and of course i'll take one more question and then maybe uh, we'll take another lot after that uh the question around uh, around uh, blood clotting as well uh, i think that's been uh, addressed uh, yes there is a question around uh, dr kk agarwal had both uh, doses uh, since they, they are part of this partners in this uh, so what happened i mean uh, you know because that was a great loss to the entire medical fraternity uh, and uh, there is a question around uh, somebody's uh, uh, rachna's mother who's 85 years old recently covid recovered negative after 4 weeks but a, a bilirubin uh, raised with days uh, 2.5 3 days later five another three hepatitis tests are negative ultrasound is clear so what is the the problem so maybe we can just open out with these questions and we'll take a second down uh, if you can you know i i leave it to to you to answer so i can answer the mucor question uh, and and uh, so uh, i think the uh, risk of a 9 year old child getting mucor is uh, post covid is really very very low very low unless the child is an insulin dependent diabetic before covid hit us mucor mycosis was largely a disease of insulin dependent diabetic children uh, you know with, in my previous assignment uh, with my colleagues here we handled intestinal mucor mycosis you know we had the team staying there 24 by 7 reported those cases cutaneous mucormycosis all kinds of rare thing but that was once or twice a year what has happened with this is that the excessive use of steroids if i may say some necessary some excessive uh, along with less attention to diabetes especially in centers which are not particularly well equipped for that has led to proliferation of this normally occurring fungus in our nasal mucosa cavity and you know then progressing to the eye and brain and whatever so in a 7 year old child who doesn't have diabetes and if he has recovered from mucor or it's completely all right the risk is very low of course if he complains of any specific thing like a nasal discharge from one side or a bloody discharge or or pain on one side of the face or eye it's a, one should see an ent but i think the risk largely is in people who have taken who have diabetes 80% by and large worldwide the data suggests are people who have diabetes it 76 to 80% are those who have received steroids these are the two proven factors from you because otherwise people are speculating lots of factors but these are the two factors that are very well proven and if one has taken care of these things then mucor mycosis should not you know uh, really scare you that it's a scary disease if it happens no question about that it's not a good disease to have but nevertheless if we are if we are not in the high risk zone we shouldn't keep worrying and i get so many calls about this i have got you know some little pain do you think i could be having mucor so it's it's not it's still not common it's far commoner than what it ever was but in absolute numbers it's still not common and for somebody who doesn't have all these things the risk is very very low 
and and uh, what about the airborne uh, how airborne is the disease should they go for walks so, is it safe to is it safe to travel on flights right now what about air conditioning can they go to office and have the air conditioner on so so see everything is relative you have to weigh your risks with with what is involved you know so open air walks are absolutely safe open air walks with masks it's not that the virus is floating around in open air there are very few documented major outbreaks in parks and all unless people are congregating and taking off their masks to have a meal together so i actually for one have always been advocating and you may have read some of that that why are the parks not open i mean you know you have to get actually people out in closed indoor envi environments is where the uh, virus spreads open air and just wear a mask a proper mask and you're pretty safe don't do it as, make it a social activity as many of us like to do go for a walk on your own with your phone or whatever or ipod whatever you use and i think it's it's the best thing you can do don't interact socially with people so open air walking is not a problem provided you wear a mask and don't engage in social conversation just hi and how are you types that's all right just crossing each other you will not pick up the virus so i think that's very very important visiting it's much worse to meet family members who come from outside guests who think you are there your own and unko kaise hoga wo to to apne hi hai sab and have them for a cup of tea in your house that is far more dangerous than than going out for a walk and of course people can as as dr triyan will probably uh, you know he's an expert in that uh, will exercise can exercise very well at home i mean there is no question if people are uh, you know uh, not able to go out for some reason or don't live in an area where there they may not be living in an area where there is enough open space then definitely they can exercise at home we all know the benefits of pranayama and yoga and you know exercise at home so there is no question but exercise is a very very important tool to build your lungs and protect yourself from covid or the adverse effects of covid right thank you uh, so from that point of view surya namaskar is a complete exercise in itself so so yes in extreme towns that is something you can fall back on but as dr mithal said that nothing like a walk in the fresh air but there is no fresh air in delhi you you're you probably exposed to so much pollution in on some days that it actually negates going out but anyway let me i would like to talk about the uh, mixing of vaccines so there is a lot of interest first of all not a lot of data yet but a lot of interest in the fact that can you enhance the immunity of an individual by combining two platforms platforms being like so so there is some work done in uk on astrazeneca and pfizer and also moderna there is a study going on in in brazil right now uh, there are studies being done in, we we have started something in india also so the basic thing is that with mixing of vaccines there have really not been any major adverse events so there is there is some data which says that if you mix the vaccine and like the pfizer or moderna that were used as the as the second dose or even as a booster dose at some point what you saw was people did get one or two three days worth of fever headaches and some shivering so they but that's not a frequent thing but but fair number so you one should be be ready for some kind of reaction if you need the booster now the whole quer controversy revolves around antibodies are antibodies in this in themselves an indicator of your immunity or not so that's debate will only get settled because if you look at the physiology and the science behind immunity this it says that there is a for short term antibodies may have much more relevance than for the long term because long term uh, resistance or immunity is stored in t cells and b cells so the, that's what we call memory t cells so cellular memory is probably more effective like we see in many other forms of uh, of immunization 
and that is something that unless enough data comes out which is being which is in progress right now you wouldn't know 100% but the ones that we know who have gone and mixed their their vaccine after the first dose have done perfectly okay we don't have enough people who we know but there are, there are studies going on there's a large study being done right now that after two doses is it is it a good idea or not we don't know so there is a lot of concern in people whose antibodies are not either at the body are not developing or vanishing real fast they are the ones who who at some sometimes get anxiety but the world view is that you should not depend on antibodies counts and most of the world is not doing that but in india it has become a little more Uh, of a talking point to say what did your you, what is your antibody count and more so in people who are in the social circuit so there is still confusion but the data will tell as as we go go forward now that also we see i am uh, like on one of, on the supreme court committee that national task force for for dealing with the current problems of covid infrastructure supplies and preparing for the third wave so there is a lot of work going on in our committees and the blueprints are being written so oxygen you can say was the first first uh, terms of reference that the the court gave us we've done a lot of work on that and i think we'll be prepared for any eventuality even if it goes above the last wave so there has been a lot of work done in by by way of reserves by way of uh, variety of sources for oxygen including what we with the oxygen generators concentrators all that other stuff i think we can deal with it much better but then as you saw the the critical pharmaceutical supplies like nobody anticipated that we would get uh, the mucomycosis uh, better known as black black fungus in such quantities that we would not have enough amphotericin i mean so so it's been one nightmare after the other of course we'll block all these things but the main thing is to say okay covid appropriate behavior repeat 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 that thousands of times all of us should do it we should practice it and we should say because that is our main weapon but at the same time we have listed the entire need for children god forbid that wave comes so that is already in progress right now we are about to submit it as the, as a report of the national task force to the courts very soon but i think one thing i can say here that i found from the inner sanctums that the government is working very hard on on trying to tackle these problems so it's it's like as may it may appear which it does because of the sheer sheer size of our of our population that we are wanting but i'm not sure any country could have dealt with this kind of situation that we had as four times 4 lakhs a day is a mind boggling figure uh, united states was was buckling under 250000 cases a day so the fact that we survived there's a lot of misery yes the many people were were in very bad shape on the streets but otherwise overall i think we have coped with it well uh, but today if we do not keep up our guard it is not going to help us in the future so i think you stress it again and again that the virus is still around it's not gone away it is mutating inside everybody that gets infected and god knows how many thousands there are there are more than 2000 documented so surveillance early warning systems preparedness public awareness an immediate reaction of tracing and locking down i think those are the kind of things we can do to, to not to suffer this fate again thank you i think so very very I'll, useful uh, i'll take i'll take i'll also take uh, are we yeah. got a few question on fatty liver as well what precautions yeah, are you going to yeah, just sure, want to sure, yeah sure yeah. sure sure so i'll take quickly take uh, two three uh, you know directions in which the questions have come one is the fatty liver and liver enzymes and bilirubin somebody's bilirubin has gone up from 2 to 3 to 5 to 7 so like i said in my earlier remarks if someone's bilirubin has gone up or enzymes have gone up 
either they're going to be temporary and they're going to come back down in three to four weeks, or it is quite likely that they have a pre-existing fatty liver. That fatty liver could be alcohol-related or diabetes-related or non-alcoholic fatty liver. And they probably missed it because it didn't cause any symptoms before. But now that COVID happened, their enzymes have gone up and they are worried. So I think that is what's happening. They need to see a liver expert uh, immediately. And like I said, majority of these instances, they would settle down with conservative treatment. It's not going to result in anything nasty. The, the other things are, of course, you have to control your diabetes and lipids and alcohol has to be avoided, uh, et cetera. If you're overweight, you have to you know, bring your weight down. So the same things which I said earlier could be the reason that you know, uh, unexpectedly the liver enzymes have gone up, but they would get better if you control the precipitating factors. The other line of questioning, which I'll just address, is uh, some people have asked, uh, what if I've had one bout of COVID and one dose of the vaccine? Should I go for the second dose or not? And there are some other people who, who want to know if they have to repeat the exercise next year. Well, the second question is a bit easier, but it is a little more fuzzy at this point. Uh, it is likely that we will need revaccination year after year or maybe every two years. Uh, there is a study recently uh, that came out about a week ago that shows that there is a protection of the infection and vaccine doses, both to the tune of eight to 12 months. So yes, it will protect you for about 12 months at least. Since we haven't had that much time beyond 12 months after vaccination, in fact, we haven't had more than six months at this point. So we don't really know the answer to beyond one year, but it is likely uh, from the lab studies and people's experiences uh, with infection that protection will last a year and you may need another vaccine next year. Now, as to the question of infection plus one dose, is it good enough? Again, uh, there are some data from the UK which show that there may be a, a good protection of uh, one Pfizer dose in addition to the previous infection that somebody may have had. Uh, we have our own data from Vedanta, which Dr. Trehan knows about, where we found that people who already have antibodies or a history of COVID infection, after one dose, they had better levels of antibodies compared to someone who didn't have COVID before and had two doses. So we have this data and we are writing it up as a paper and it should hopefully it will be published soon. So there is some evidence that one infection plus one dose of vaccine may be good enough, but this is not incontrovertible at present. So at present, two doses of vaccines is what you need. And if you've had an infection bout, then wait 90 days before you go for your vaccine. In fact, if you have any procedure scheduled, you should take it, you should take the vaccine four weeks after the procedure or two weeks before the procedure. Perfect. I think that's uh, very, very uh, informative. I know there are lots of questions. I, there are at least another 50 questions, but I know we're running out of time. So with, with your permission, if I could just compile, we could, we could get these questions compiled and maybe send them to you if you can, you know, uh, because I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure whether you have more time, uh, given the fact that all of you are very busy doctors. So with your permission, we, yeah, yes, uh, Amrishi, Anji. I think just one point uh, which deserves uh, reiteration is that diabetes is not a contraindication to vaccination. There are still so many questions on that in the chat box. If you have diabetes, it's all the more reason to get vaccinated and vaccinated fast. That is very important. Don't need any special tests don't need anything. You should, of course, control your diabetes. But if even if you're uncontrolled, don't wait for it to be controlled. You just get your vaccine regardless of what kind of diabetes you have. So that's very important. Still, people are, every day I get these calls, you know, my sugar is high. Can I get a vaccine? Today, this morning, it's 200. Can I go for my vaccination? Yes, you can. Please get your vaccine regardless of your diabetic status. Perfect. So with, with your permission, can we extend for another five, 10 minutes or should we send you the questions or would you like to give, I mean, maybe you give some closing remarks, the questions are in front of you. So I'm, 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 I'm aware that all of you are very, very busy doctors. So if you'd like to give any closing remarks uh, in addition to what you've just said. I've done mine. Perfect. It was a pleasure. So I, like so like I, I said, it, it, was, it yeah. was very, you know, it was very, very engaging, the interaction. And I hope so, people who participated have benefited. 
So we'll, we'll maybe send you some of these questions. Happy to address questions. the questions. Yeah, sure. yeah we, we'll sure. try and send you the unanswered questions if you can, you know, address those. And and it's it's really reassuring, I think, for all of us to know that so much research has been done by all of you individually as well as collectively within the institutions you are with. Uh, and and hopefully, as and when there is a a third wave, we are in safe hands. We will be far better prepared for the for the third wave and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we will not have the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, panic as well as fertility that we had in the last wave. Uh, thank you so much. With that, I'm handing over to uh, Dr. Harsh Mahajan to give the formal vote of thanks. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you Ashwajit. very much, uh, Ashwajit. Uh, it was really a very engaging, very informative session. And, uh, uh, you know, done in, uh, 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 without using any of the medical jargon, that most of the big doctors are used to. So thank you very much, Dr. Trayan, Dr. Arvinder Soyan, Dr. Amrish Mittal. These are really the, the stalwarts of the healthcare field in the country. And we are so fortunate, lucky, and honored to have them on the Meradoc uh, platform. And uh, as you can see, uh, you know, we hit the peak as far as uh, the, the number of people who could join was, and in addition to that, we have so many other uh, social media platforms where this is being shown live. So thank you all very much. And we hope uh, that, uh, you know, a few weeks down the line, we may get you all back again, because this has been a very dynamic learning process during this pandemic. And every two weeks, we learn something new and have to course correct. I would be failing my duty if I did not thank the London School of Economics Alumni Association of Delhi, who've been very active. Uh, Masosa, uh, the Modern School Old uh, Students Association, uh, IPA Global, and Ashwajit, and of course, the Heartcare Foundation of India, Dr. K.K. Agarwal Research Fund. Dr. K.K. Agarwal, who is so dear to all of us, a very, very close friend of mine, and who gave his all during this pandemic in educating masses uh, at large. In fact, there used to be 100,000 people listening to his webinars and his talks, uh, and we really miss him dearly. But I do know that wherever he is, he would be again healing and teaching and training in that world as well. So thank you all very much. And uh, we look forward, uh, Ashwajit, to the next webinar. Thank you, Miradok. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you once again. Thanks a lot. All the best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank, thanks, Ashwajit and Harsh. Thank you, sir. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thank you.